Hey everybody and welcome to Views on View. I'm Ari Clark and I'm a front-end developer at Liquid Inc. And today on our panel we have Ben Hong, who is a senior front-end engineer at GitLab. Hello. And we have Chris Fritz, who is apparently a member of the View team. Hey. <laughs> and today we are talking about talks and workshops. Do you ever wonder how your application gets put onto the devices that it runs on? Whether it's a mobile app being run on an iPhone or Android phone, or whether you're talking about a web app that gets deployed to servers or containers through something like Kubernetes, there's always something going on and understanding how all that stuff goes together can drastically help you figure out how to solve the problems and how to architecture your application better in order to take advantage of how things are set up. You should check out our new podcast, Adventures in DevOps. Adventures in DevOps is a sort of continuation of the Food Fight Show, but is a new podcast. You can find it at adventuresindevopspodcast.com. All right. So where should we start? I guess what makes a good talk? Sounds good. So like, when you all are watching talks, like what do you like in a talk? What's in a talk that makes you get really excited and want to get out your laptop right away and start coding? I guess for me, I think a lot of it is when speakers provide like an easy call to action that allows me to either visit like visit their repo so I can clone it and play around with it. Those really help for like the next call to action because sometimes, you know, a topic might be something I want to get involved with, but if it's hard to like figure out where to find resources and it's not easy to figure out that path, it can make it hard to kind of jump on it when inspiration strikes. Yeah, that's true. If I don't really know like what I'm doing afterwards, then that idea just kind of fades and then I forget about the talk. And I think I'm, I'm more likely to follow that call to action if they're talking about a problem that I feel like I have all the time or yeah. that I've encountered before. Definitely. You know, so if they, if they start like right away with like why this talk will be good for me to listen to, then I'm, I'm going to pay much more attention. A lot, a lot of times I, I don't really find out like why the talk might be relevant to me until like halfway through. And then the first half, I've just kind of like zoned out for because I, I don't really have any context to place it in. Yeah, like you're like, where is this going? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and do I care? And Yeah, yeah. And then maybe halfway through, you find out maybe you don't care. And then you're like, ah, did I just waste <laughs> like 15 minutes of my time? <laughs> I'm totally kidding. Uh, yeah, I no, no, but like, it, yeah, it does, it does help me. Relatable to like, yeah, problems that you've experienced definitely keeps me engaged, like from the get go. But also being funny totally keeps me engaged as well. <laughs> yes, humor is always good. Yeah, like authentic humor. Don't try to fake it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no one likes that. A lot of people don't like my authentic humor either. So uh, <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> hit or miss either way. <laughs> The random sound effects in View Amsterdam seem to hit a chord. Mm -hmm. I, I, I never know if people are laughing with me or at me. It's, it's, I, 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 I guess either works, right? Yeah. yeah. It works. <laughs> I think something else too, that when they have really inspirational examples, I think obviously Sarah Drasner is a great example of that, where mm -hmm, she yeah. just shows beautiful demos that you're just like, oh, like I want to do that. I never had that problem, but I, now I know I have that problem and, or like, you know, I want to figure that out. I don't know. Like Sarah Drasner's demos just make me feel bad about myself. Because oh. <laughs> I'm like, I will never be on that level. But at the same time, I'm like, wow, look at all the cool stuff that I could be doing. I should probably try to at least tackle learning how to do some of it. So yeah, her demos are very aspirational. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, yeah, having super polished demos is something that definitely keeps me engaged in a talk. A lot of people see Sarah's demos and think, I, I didn't even know that was possible. And that's their jumping off point to oh God, yeah. like discovering no. this, this new API <laughs> or tool or pattern. Yeah, exactly. And they can already imagine like how much people will like praise them when you know they present this to the team or they present this to the client. <laughs> oh, for sure. You're and like, oh I'm my God, I'm going to win so many cool points. Like my street cred is going to be crazy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sometimes on, on teams that I'm, I'm working on, we have a task that's just like, Chris gets to spend time like making it really like pretty and feel good. <laughs> you know, so like when I'm working on a data visualization, sometimes I just want to like add this little like these little touches that just make it really awesome. And then I have to 
not spend the rest of the day playing with it and actually get some more work done. <laughs> that is, yeah, the struggle is real on that. So what are, what are some of the favorite talks that you both have seen in the past year? I would have to say Miriam Suzanne's talk at ViewConf, partly for the content, but also because of her callbacks to every other talk. I was like, that is incredible. How did you like work that in on the fly? Because obviously, <laughs> like she couldn't have known some of those things ahead of time. And it just worked flawlessly. And I was entertained, but she also was talking, the content was super relevant to problems I was having. So that was definitely one of my favorites. And she does that every time. That's one of the reasons that we put her near the end. <laughs> yeah, no, I was like, what? <laughs> It's perfect. Because she she knocks that out of the park. Yes. Her talk was not only like had a lot of interesting content in and of itself, but it it also reminded me of all of the things that I learned and like all all the things that we talked about. So it was it was just a perfect capstone. It really was, yeah. And I think that's that's a reason that people like really want Miriam because they know that she can do like that specific kind of talk which is useful for any kind of conference. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, she's just a fantastic human being and you feel that when she talks. So that's also true, yeah. Yes. What about you, Ben? Yeah, I'm trying to think. I think um, actually Callum McCray's talk on accessibility with Vue, JS at Vue Amsterdam was done really well. He has like case studies where he brings on someone on the screen that actually is like using software that really contextualizes things for the audience that I thought was really powerful. And just a reminder that we still have, uh, you know, a lot of software and things that we build have a long way to go as far as like making accessibility like a first class citizen and those sort of things. So I think in that regard, it was very inspirational. He also shows you exactly what the experience is like, like using yeah. a screen reader. And so it's, it's not an abstract concept anymore. Right. Like this is the concrete problem that now like people in the audience have experienced indirectly. It's Absolutely. perfect. Yeah, he does a great job with that. How about yourself, Chris? The ones you mentioned, I, I really, really enjoyed. I also loved Crystal Campioni's talk about yes. view animations. Oh my gosh. That, and that was so, so cool. awesome. I loved it. Oh, that, that was so amazing. Yeah, it just, it inspired me in so many ways. And I do a lot of stuff with like data visualization animations. And there were still like ideas that she that she had in there that made me think like, oh yeah, I could use that for this. And I could, I could use that for this. And, and you can look at all the code later. And she, she showed a lot of the code and walked people through it. It was just awesome. It was great. And similarly on animations, I really enjoyed Rachel Neighbors' introduction to ViewConf uh, last year. Like a lot of people cite that as the, the best introduction to like view transitions that exists. Yeah, Rachel's so awesome. So for people who haven't seen that, definitely check it out. What about stuff that's not in a good talk? What do people generally want to avoid? Reading from your slides. <laughs> that is generally, yeah, textbook 101 of not the things you don't want to do when you're presenting as far as like having too, much, too, too many words on your slides. Because you want people to be focusing on what you're saying and not reading what's on the projector. Yeah, I, I think it's useful to have... Yeah, go ahead, Ari. So this is something I've been sort of conflicted about myself. Is like, does that apply to code examples as well? Because I mean, if you're giving code examples, like showing code snippets, is that distracting? <laughs> and I don't like. I honestly don't know where I land on that. I think it is good to focus people's attention on specific parts of the code snippets. And a few people that do this really, really well are like Greg Pollock and Adam Jar from View School, and also Divya Sasiraan. They do a great job of having like the relevant parts of the code on the screen, but having certain pieces faded out and, you know, others highlighted and sometimes magnified. And that makes it a lot easier to follow and and helps you understand like which part of the code you're talking about, like as you're, as you're talking about it. I am still trying to get better at that. I am trying to use their tricks. (laughs) So one of the things I've noticed working with them is that it's really about stripping away any context that you, like the audience does not need. So it's really easy to have like extra HTML elements or CSS. Like if the user doesn't need, like if the audience doesn't need to see that, like strip it out, put like some dot 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 to imply that there's other code in here 
But the one you really care about and the only things you need to focus on are these things. So I think that really helps the audience to zero in on what's important. Yeah, that's something I'm, I'm currently struggling with is finding that balance of enough context, but not a distracting amount of context in code snippets. The fact that you're being intentional about it is really the important part. And to Chris's point, if you do call outs as far as like darkening most of the background, except for what you're calling out, little things like that, that'll help you a lot. Yeah, I will say uh, slides.com has a really awesome feature that will do uh, code highlighting for you, which is, nice. yeah, it takes the work out, <laughs> which <laughs> makes me happy. <laughs> and what else do you sometimes see in a talk that makes you immediately think, Ugh, oh boy. <laughs> For me, I've seen sometimes when people get into anecdotal things, they kind of lose themselves. Like they don't know where they're going. So they kind of start rambling about like their situation. <laughs> and so if you're going to do a personal anecdote about some situation, like make sure you know where you're going to end. <laughs> um, I feel that one though. Because <laughs> I'm like, oh God, that's me. <laughs> yeah, tangents. The same can be true for, for jokes too. Like a lot of jokes can essentially be tangents. But if you go on a joke for too long, like it, yeah. it's going to start feeling weird. Unless you're an MC and need to kill time, then, then you yeah, drag it out. Well, oh, yeah, that's your job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How about you, Chris? Is there anything that makes you cringe when you hear a talk? See, when people start with the solution, you know, that definitely, you know, instead of talking about like the problem to begin with, you know, the problem that you're actually solving for people or you're going to help people solve. That's probably the number one thing that I see that makes me worried. You know, because then I, I, I know there are going to be a ton of people in the audience who are just already fading out because they don't even know whether this is something that's important to them. And once that's people true. start fading out, it's difficult to get them back sometimes. Yeah, I think a lot of people when they give t- or like writing talks, it's easy to think you're just writing technical things. But I mean, a talk, you are entertaining an audience to a degree. So it's like the more you craft it as a story with technical details, I think the more you can engage your audience and keep them engaged and listening. I feel torn on this. And I think that there are different opinions on this, but I think it's, it's good to be animated. So I personally, like, I, I like to use hand gestures and I like to see like other people, you know, that look like they're passionate about something. If they're just kind of, you know, standing still, it's not as exciting. Like if I'm standing like right in front of the projector, sometimes I even like running over to like the screen and like jumping up and pointing to something. And that's like more fun for me. And I I think hopefully also like more engaging for people than just like pointing with a laser pointer or something like that. No, I agree. Like Tessa's talk at Bucomp, one of the things I really liked about her talk was her use of the stage. Like she was definitely, she worked the stage and, you know, she like was moving across the stage. I don't think I could do that personally because I tend to fidget a lot when I'm giving a talk. So like I have to, I have to ground myself at the podium, but like for people who can do that smoothly, like it keeps you engaged. Cause no, I totally talk with my hands. And when I see videos of myself, I'm like, oh my God, it's too much. It's too much. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I, I used to be in theater too. So I just, I, I don't like to sit still. Yeah. So, and like, the thing is, is, yeah, I agree. I like it when other people do it, but when it's me, I'm like, is it, it's too much, right? It's too much. <laughs> yeah, it can be distracting. Like if you're constantly doing the same gesture, like with everything that you say, you're just like waving your hands up and down. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> I mean, that Stop can... calling me out. <laughs> no, <laughs> I mean, I'm more talking about things that I've done and I try to stop doing Uh, Yeah, yeah, that that can be distracting. Yeah, I I would say trying to be overly professional in your presentation, you know, keeping it very low key, like I'm a super serious person. This is a super serious talk. Like, yeah, that loses me really fast. Like, I want to know that you're passionate about your subject. Mm -hmm. I also like it when people are speaking more like they're in a conversation, like, like how you two are speaking right now. Yeah. Rather than like they're giving a speech. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, I want to feel like they're talking to me and not just mm-hmm. talking to a room. Yeah, making good eye contact with people and stuff like that is, is good. Or even, even just 
I think looking at one person. If yeah, you're just no, like, someone, I read, if you just like pick a person and look at them yeah. and just no, stare them. Someone gave like a really good tip. Find the person that's smiling and nodding along with you. And I did that when I when I was super nervous about giving my talk a, a couple of weeks ago. And yeah, there was a, a a woman in the room who was you know just smiling and nodding along with everything. And then when you're nervous, having like that one person that just constantly validate you really helps. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Mm-hmm. And I I think kind of on a similar note, like audience interaction is something that I, I think like a lot of speakers could do more of. Like for yeah. any talk that's longer than like two minutes, people will eventually struggle to like stay paying attention. And I, I guess they'll struggle if you're only talking to them. But if you are like involving them in the conversation sometimes, you know, like say like, oh, how many people have had this problem? Or, you know, like, and people can raise their hands. Or if you give them some way to respond to you or like be part of the talk, then that'll keep them engaged. I also found that as a speaker, that helps me gauge how, <laughs> how well I'm doing so far. Because <laughs> like, if I'm like, okay, who's lost? And like only a couple people raise their hand. I'm like, okay, good. Oh, all right. <laughs> okay, so far. Ooh, but, but here's actually a nitpick I have as a teacher. Oh. When people ask who's lost, you're not going to get very many hands because people are going to be worried. It's like, oh, what if I'm the only one who's lost? I don't want to raise my hand and then everybody sees that. And then, so it's, I, I think it's always good to ask the opposite. You know, the, the thing that people will be like eager to let you know rather than afraid to let you know. You know, so like, you know, who already feels like they understand scope slots or, you know, whatever it is you're talking about. And then people can raise their hand there and then you'll get a, a better idea of like what portion of the audience actually understands and doesn't understand. That's a great point. Yeah. Wow. I just, I now feel like I've approached life totally wrong. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I, I'm sure you haven't approached oh, life. That's pretty. super helpful. And, I, and that's, it's easy to do. Like I still do that sometimes and I try to catch myself. It's something I, I learned as a teacher. You always want to like, ask who understands rather than who doesn't understand. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. It does. So I personally don't like it when speakers, like, even though, even if I know that they're an absolute subject matter expert, I don't want to feel like they're talking to me. Like they know more than me, even though they do. (laughs) So I guess like a little (laughs) goes a long way for me. Cause like, in order for it to be relatable to me, I have to feel that they struggle with it sometimes too. And because, yeah, I want someone who's, who I feel has been in my shoes to tell me what I can do to improve my experience as a developer. I don't want you know, someone who never struggled with it telling me because I'm like, that's not going to work for me because you clearly are just good at this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's totally true. And, and similarly, for people who... I, I, I don't, I don't want to watch people talk for five minutes about their credentials. <laughs> yeah. just get into it. Like if, if you have some relevant experience, like talk about that for like 10 seconds or less. But yeah, I mean, I think some people understandably can feel like they, they need to prove themselves up there. Yeah. That's definitely a common feeling. Yeah. But if you're, if you're up there on a stage, like people are already going to assume that you must be pretty smart. <laughs> If, you know, someone let you be up there. Yeah, right. No. Though I feel now that I will be giving a talk at a conference, I'm like, well, if they let me do it, hmm, maybe, maybe they're not as smart as I think they are. <laughs> <laughs> maybe everyone's just people. <laughs> yeah, no. And actually, honestly, that is what I have finally realized. You know, like the only difference between someone who's given a conference talk and someone else is that they were on a stage at some point. That's all. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So actually, I think that segues pretty nicely into how to get started talking. Yeah. So if you've never talked before, if you've never given a talk before, what are, you, what are recommendations? I personally think starting at a meetup is a sure bet <laughs> to at least sort yes. of hone it. Because the first time you give a talk is probably not going to be the best version of that talk. But Local meetups are pretty 
low risk <laughs> in terms of like, you know, they t- they, it tends to be a very friendly environment, a more personal environment. People will generally feel a little more comfortable giving you feedback afterwards. And usually meetup organizers are looking for speakers. So it's a pretty easy way to get in. Yeah. You don't have to like send along your resume or be like somewhat famous within the community to, <laughs> to get to talk there. By the way, you don't have to do that for like an actual conference talk either. You don't have to send in your resume or anything. <laughs> and you, don't have to, you don't have to be famous either. <laughs> I mean, I, I have seen some CFPs, so they kind of ask you to prove yourself with like, give us all the talks you've ever given before. And that can be a little scary, I think, for new like speakers. Because um, they feel like if they don't have it, then maybe they're not qualified. So you know, I have a little bit of a mixed feeling about that. Because I understand why as an organizer, you would want that. Yeah, I guess it, as an org- organizer myself, I do like to see that people have some experience. And if you can go to a meetup and just have a friend like record your talk on their phone or laptop or whatever. That's fantastic. And you could just send that in because for me, like I just kind of want to see that you can stand up in front of people and talk about something and get a general sense of your presentation style. Like, you know, do you have just like a wall of text in your slides? You know, are, are you checking in with the audience? You know, are you you know, making a lot of assumptions and uh, introducing a lot of jargon that people might not be familiar with. You know, so I, I maybe will watch sometimes like five minutes of a talk, you know, sometimes longer than that, but usually sometimes even just like 30 seconds and I can see 30 seconds and realize, oh, this person knows what they're doing. We're good. Yeah. Speaking of that, that's actually how I think I managed to get into my first conference was recording my talk at VIEW, like DC, which is the local meetup I run. And so I created an opportunity to speak and then I recorded it, put it on YouTube. And that was like my reference point for people going forward. So I'm a real life testament to that strategy. <laughs> I, like, I like what you just said about creating an opportunity to speak because that's really what it is. When you want to get started, it is up to you in some sense to create that opportunity, but it's pretty easy to create that opportunity. <laughs> uh-huh. Yep. So you recommend starting for starting at a meetup and and getting some feedback. What are some good ways to collect feedback from people? Like, do you just walk up to people afterwards and say like, hey, how did you like my talk? And if they say, oh yeah, it was good, then there's nothing to, nothing to do. It was perfect. That's what so- I used to do. <laughs> Until Chris talked to me. <laughs> the meetup organizer gave me advice that I, of course, failed to take, but her point was excellent. She suggested that before I started my talk that I expressed that I was interested in receiving feedback because people will listen differently than if they don't know you want feedback. And of course, I got totally forgot to say that. So oops. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, a lot of times for stuff like that, if I'm afraid I might forget it, I just put it in a slide. So I just like have a slide with nothing on it except the word feedback. Oh, that's that's a good tip. I think I'm and then that. I'll see that and be like, oh yeah, I got to talk about that. Yeah. I'm totally stealing that. <laughs> I stole it from lots of other people, so I can't take any credit. Just paying it forward. <laughs> yeah, I said, what do you recommend then? Um, besides, because uh, you know, um, people are just saying, oh, I liked your talk. Um, obviously, that on the one hand, I know that for me, when I used to get that, it's like, oh, like, do they mean that? Are they being nice? And then it's hard to actually like. Get anything that's actionable or you don't yeah. know sure about yourself <laughs> at the yeah. end. Yeah. Especially people who are my friends, you know, which is more <laughs> likely to happen at a meetup, like if you are involved and know <laughs> the people in your community. See, like you just if, need you, to if you have ask mean them friends and then it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you don't want mean friends because it's just like, listen, I don't know, you looked um I don't know, you look kind of shabby up there. Like, is that the shirt you're gonna wear for the actual talk? <laughs> It's like, what? I thought this was a nice shirt. <laughs> Is that how your hair always looks? It, I think I think so. <laughs> Is that, that, you don't want to, you don't want to be a friend. It does? I mean, does your face always make that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. We got to stop talking about this, Ross. I'm going to start feeling really subconscious. Anyway. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, no, and that's why it's such a good idea to say ahead of time that you are looking for feedback because otherwise, yeah, people has been pointed out many times. The audience is on your side. They want you to succeed. 
And so they're listening with an ear for what you're doing right, unless you tell them otherwise. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give you full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So... If you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. And personally, I don't like to ask people afterwards, like, oh, how, did, how did you think it went? Right. Yeah. Because then they're <laughs> they're probably just going to say like, oh yeah, it was good. Exactly. Um, instead, I'll ask them questions that they can't wiggle their way out of to be nice. <laughs> okay. So like, how, how would you ask these questions? Here we go. So for example, like, is there something you were inspired to try that you saw demonstrated in the talk? And then they have to actually like, you know, remember something. Or if they, if they said... You know, if I said like, you know, there were three things that I wanted people to remember about view three when I was talking about it, like what are the the three things that, you know, can you list three things that you remembered, you know, about view three from the talk? They can't wiggle their way out of it and just say like, oh yeah, I think you said all the things actually. It was good. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they could, but it'd be super obvious what they were doing. You know, so, so, so that way it, it helps me. It helps me see whether I'm actually meeting my objectives rather than just like whether it was good in general. I mean, this means actually having objectives. You know, when you have a talk, figure out like what you want people to take away and be realistic. Like they're probably only going to remember like maybe up to three things and there should be one thing that is like the most important thing that you want them to remember. And I I often think of people's interactions with other people afterwards to figure out what I want those goals to be? Like, how do I want to change their behavior? Like, what do I want them to do in their work? What do I want them to do in their community? If a friend is asking them how the talk was, what do I want them to say? Or if they ask like what the talk was about, like what is their one, what should their one sentence explanation be? Absolutely. This is all really good. I'm learning so much. <laughs> yeah, it was a game changer for me because it, it, it gives you more confidence as a speaker to know that you're either like a metric you can measure your talk against rather than the feel good, like you did a great job and like, you yeah. know, they're nice, nice, uh, nice as like frosting. But what you really want to know is like whether the, the message was delivered. And so that's actually helped me with writing talks actually as well. So on the topic of like getting started, like if you have objectives, you'll prevent yourself from like just going on tangents and being like, oh, I have to cover everything. Like, no, you need to cover like the two, as Chris said, max three things you want people to take away from and then find ways to build up to it. And that is basically your talk um, once you've established those things. Yeah. And the one, like the one thing you want them to do afterwards, like the, the call to action. And I also think a lot of people don't realize when they're trying to get started speaking is that your experience is unique and worth talking about. It's easy to be like, oh, well, someone's already done a talk on this. And so your goal is not to necessarily, unless you happen to be, but you're not supposed to be like the subject matter expert of whatever you're talking about. So, you know, if I like, I gave a talk on ViewPress, like I didn't write ViewPress and I'm not the know all be all, but I helped to evangelize it and talk about what I was passionate about it and why you should consider it. And, you know, I think, Chris, I think we were talking this before, but like case studies aren't submitted enough to conferences because I think a lot of people do belittle their own experience of like how maybe they use Vue at their company or some interesting problem they saw that they don't think is worth it. But a lot of people would actually love to hear about. Yeah. And the, the people who like don't have experience building libraries or learned how to do something relatively more recently, like are also coming at it with more of a beginner's mindset, you know, so they know, like they remember like what they struggled with when they were learning this thing. And they know like what they're, what problems they're trying to solve. And they're not going to get distracted by like all the different things they had to keep in mind while they were building the library or something like that. 
Yeah, I think one of the most useful perspectives um, in a speaker is when they're talking about a topic they struggled to master or even, um, let's not even say master, but struggled to comprehend because they're going to know what it's like to not understand it. And they're going to know what their path to understanding was. I would much rather hear from someone who it was hard for. Absolutely. Uh So the very first talk I ever gave, yeah, it was about something that I really struggled with uh, because there just really wasn't a lot of documentation around it. And all of the pain I went through uh, in trial and error, figuring out how to make this thing work. I know that that was a valuable experience because I came out the other side. So I'm sure at least one other person in this room will get value from that. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, if you think about TV shows too, like who wants to watch a TV show with no conflict? If it's just all like, everything was done, everything was good. It was happy ending from the beginning. Right, like, yeah. No one's going to stick around to watch it. And so finding that conflict is a great way to get um, your talk relatable to the audience. Do you have any advice for getting started as well, Chris? I mean, I agree with the conflict. I think at the beginning of the UJS London talk, I, I challenged Alex Chopin to a, to a dance-off later. So it's, it's, a, it's a great way to get attention, create some drama. Yeah. yeah. I never thought about that. Create conflict in the talk. Yeah. Which Make sure to just tra- trash talk all the other speakers. Yeah. yeah I'm going to try that kidding. for sure. Please don't do that. Do you want to do that? <laughs> we'll never be invited back again if you trash talk speakers. I don't know, but I like this dance off idea. I feel like maybe every conference needs at least one dance off, right? Yeah. Well, so Alex started his talk for context with. Like a really cool choreographed dance. What? Yeah. So I had to, I, I had to say something about that. Well, yeah, because <laughs> I mean, it's not like you're going to top that. So. <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll ju- no, I, I certainly did not. <laughs> but pretending that you could gives you street cred. That's how that works. Is that what street cred is? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's it's false confidence. <laughs> I mean, if you really think about it, I think in most cases, it totally is. <laughs> so what about when people are submitting a CFP to a conference? You know, they've given a, a talk a, a few times at a meetup or, or maybe even just once. And, you know, they've gotten some good feedback and they want to try it at a, at a bigger venue. What do they have to do to submit a CFP? What, the, what should they know? The number one piece of advice I have for that is that you can submit more than one CFP to conferences. And I would actually highly encourage you to do so just because when you only submit one, you run the risk of either having people want to talk about the same thing or you happen to like collide. Like, for example, I think I forgot which conference this was. I happened to submit an animation talk that Sarah Drasner was going to be at. So, <laughs> you know, if we're being realistic. <laughs> Sarah yeah. Drasner's animation talk is going to get chosen over mine. Yeah. So it's sort of hedging your bets um, as far as like... Because again, there are different types of talks. There's like the subject the, like subject matter expert where you've worked really a lot with a library versus like your case study CFP or versus like, you know, something inspirational. So definitely come up with more than one idea. And I have more on that, but I'm curious to hear what other people have to say. What exactly goes into a CFP? Like how much information should you be providing in this? Is it a few sentences? Is it your life story? (laughs) It totally depends on the conference, but typically at a minimum, it's the title of your talk and then the abstract, like the description. Yeah. How how long is a good description? Sometimes they ask for like a a long description and a short description, you know, so they'll usually tell you like what, how many words they're looking for or something like that. It's roughly two to three sentences for the short abstract. Like if you can envision your talk being posted on a website, like that's what you would envision that abstract usually kind of represents. But either way, I think in that description, it's good to answer a few questions. There's um, a blog post that Sarah May wrote in 2014 that is still super relevant and super helpful about like CFPs, about conference proposals. And I think in the talk title and the description, you should be answering the questions like, who is this talk for? And, you know, making sure that like a lot of people at the conference will be able to get a lot out of this. Like if this is a super advanced, you know, view talk that you're giving at a more general conference, there aren't that many people who are going to get into that. Yeah. You know, so, so keep that in mind. And similarly, like if even at like a, a view conference, if there's something that is super advanced, some people will get something out of that, but see if you can, like appeal to the people who aren't advanced too, so that they can still get something out of it. And 
communicate why what you're doing is exciting or how it solves like a specific pain that is common to developers. And I think the biggest mistake with CFPs, especially so, you know, Chris's advice is on point. But the hardest part about submitting your CFP is you rarely get feedback on why the organizer did not choose or did choose your CFP, particularly that did not choose. So it's really important to actually run your abstract by friends, coworkers, or people who have also spoke before. I know a lot of speakers actually are happy to give feedback on like just what they get, you know, like, or just actually you don't even need speakers. Just ask people what they think when they read your abstract. That'll give you a good idea of whether or not you're hitting the mark or not before. Otherwise, it can feel like you're just submitting something into a vacuum and not sure what's going on. And I wouldn't even ask them what they think. I would ask them, like, looking from the title, what do you think or who do you think this talk is for? And what do you expect to get out of the talk by the end if you saw it? You know, to make sure you are meeting your goals. Yeah, that's a great point. Because a lot of times people are going to decide, especially in a multi track conference, whether they want to see your talk based on the title alone. Like sometimes the description will be buried somewhere. It might be like on the website, but most people are looking at this little planner where, you know, you just see little blocks in the schedule with the titles. Yeah, that's a great point. So the title itself has to sell the talk and has to like let people know that like, oh, this is for me. This, this solves problems that I have. How do you come up with topics? Like, you know, Ben mentioned submitting multiple CFPs. How do you even come up with multiple CFPs? Like what types of things should you be drawing from? You guys also mentioned like different types of talk, like case studies or inspirational could you go into a little bit more detail on that? Like the different types of talks that you would typically see at a conference? When people ask me, what should I talk about? I usually ask back, what have you been really geeked about lately? Or like, what problems have you solved lately that you, know, you are excited about solving that were difficult problems? And starting from those places, like I, it helps you find the intersection of what's going to be interesting to other people and what's going to be a good fit for you. Because I, I see a lot of people thinking like, oh, well, there should probably be some kind of like Vuex talk. So I'll just like talk about Vuex or, you know, there should be some kind of testing talk. So I'll just submit a talk about testing. When they're not really passionate about those things and they don't really have anything personal to share there, you know, they just feel like those generically might be good topics. And the generically good topics are also going to be topics that other people are submitting a lot of proposals on as well. So yours has to stand out in some way, you know. So if you can make it personal, that's a that's a great way to make it stand out. Sounds like great advice. Yeah. So I would say there are, I think I have like five categories of talks. So one is when you're introducing something brand new. So again, like ViewPress, that was my example of like, here's a new technology most people probably haven't used. So let me evangelize it. So there's like the evangelist talk. Um, like we mentioned, there's the case study, which is your personal experience. There's the tutorial. So if you want to like walk people through and sort of like teach them a new concept. So I think like Adam's talk on Vuex is a great example of this, like getting people to understand a concept, you know, because a lot of people know what Vuex is, but maybe not understand it deeply. And the other one is, uh, I think a lot of people is called TDD, which is talk-driven development. So it's like when you choose a topic that you don't really know about, but you want to talk about it. So you write an interesting abstract before you've actually talked about it. And then if it gets accepted, then you do all the research and you do... So it's, it's definitely a painful... It can be painful. But I know there are plenty of speakers who do sort of like topic-driven development. Like, ooh, WebAssembly, that sounds interesting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to submit a WebAssembly 101 talk. And then like, if I can accept it, I'll figure out what I'm talking about. That's, that's How to combine so <laughs> WebAssembly and Bitcoin. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> to create a new artificial intelligence. Oh, the trifecta. <laughs> but it's so funny though. Sometimes when you do crazy things like that, once you get accepted, like in the process, you'll have the opportunity to still actually massage your talk. And I've seen speakers who are like, you know, originally the topic was this, and then I realized it needed to be this. <laughs> and then it's still an actually really interesting talk because they're like, yeah, Bitcoin and AI, that just didn't go all together. But here's what I learned. And so, you, you, but just the act of creating, I think, is a lot of times what you need that energy and relatability. Okay, so you guys are obviously very involved in conferences. So when you're putting together a conference lineup, what are you looking for? Like, are you looking at the lineup as a whole? Is it always just individually? What goes into making 
what you guys consider a good conference lineup? I personally do a, a few different rounds. So the, the first round is just, you know, getting a short list. And the short list might still include like half the talks, but I just want to weed out some things that I know I'm not interested in. So if there are like spelling mistakes in your title, I'm going to, I, I'm going to look <laughs> further. <scary>. Yeah. <laughs> Cause like, yeah, I'm looking for attention to detail. That's one of the things I'm looking for. And if you couldn't even just like look for a spelling mistake in the title, a spelling mistake in like the description or something like that's more understandable, but like, read the title twice at least. (laughs) And uh, I'm also looking for like talks that I can usually like imagine who it's for. And I can imagine the the people that would get excited for that talk. And I believe that they will actually be at the conference. And that doesn't mean the, the talk title has to already be good. If it is good, like I'm much more likely to to take a closer look at it because then I have I have more confidence that you have an understanding about how to like communicate and how to like sell the idea. But if it's an otherwise good proposal, like I might still, you know, reach out and make some suggestions, say like, hey, could we change the title? Most conference organizers I talk to do not do that though. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they'll just if the marketing isn't good from the beginning, they'll just discount it. You know, but I, I like to find people who, you know, maybe aren't as seasoned speakers. And so they don't know as much about the marketing, but, you know, they, they could give a really great talk. I don't want to discount those people. And also, if, if you have some kind of link to a video, I, I personally find that really useful. Again, even just to see 30 seconds to see, oh, okay, they can actually talk in front of people without, you know, just going on about nonsense and talking for five minutes about how qualified they are. <laughs> That's helpful yeah. to me. And it doesn't matter the size of the venue. I, I honestly don't care about if it's like in front of three people or in front of a thousand people. I'll be looking for what the same if, thing. What if it's just you in front of a mirror? Is that acceptable? <laughs> or does Honest, there actually have to be other people? <laughs> honestly, I've seen that before and it's better than nothing. Yeah, that makes mm. sense. Because speaking to a video camera, I think is actually harder. Yes. Uh, yeah, ways. oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> than speaking to people. <laughs> Yeah, no, I found that recently because yeah, I was trying to practice my talk by like recording myself. Yeah, it was way harder than actually talking to people. Yes. It's like if you're talking to one person who just has a blank expression on their face the whole time. Yeah, you have no feedback about like whether you're doing okay, whether they understand. There's no head nodding. They're just staring at you. No, you end up just like second guessing everything you're saying. You're like, people, no, people aren't going to like that. I should start over. <laughs> So really, like that's, I, I would love that. I would prefer that to to nothing. But if you can, you know, just get someone to, like, even just record a video on their phone of you giving a talk somewhere. Yeah, you know, even at a meetup, there, even if it's just for your friend who's taking the video. Hmm. Yeah, I think one of the hardest things with conference lineup is, you know, I know that organizers have to consider the fact that people are paying money to come watch people speak. So you know. It's hard because you have to balance making sure you bring in quality speakers and not, and also balancing giving new people the opportunity to talk, which is one of the reasons why, to Chris's point, it's really important to show some sort of like effort on your part. Because if speaking at a conference is a like big goal of yours, then recording yourself should be like, that's kind of like you should have the, like the passion and energy to put yourself through that. Because otherwise, like it, it shows kind of a lack of commitment on your part too, too, because. Remember, like they're bringing you on when people pay sometimes thousands of dollars to you know spend time listening. So um, I think that's one thing to always consider, you know, as you're submitting CFPs and to not let your ego get attached to it if it's rejected for whatever reason. Because there's so many reasons CFPs get rejected. I can't even begin to. I mean, Chris, maybe you can elaborate um, in your experience of CFPs like rejections that you wanted to take in but you couldn't. For example, I, I mean, a lot of times there's just. Like another talk that I want that is too similar, you know. So, so for example, if th- there's already a talk on on testing, and you know, I don't feel like this adds a lot new, or or at least not enough that's new that I'm willing to sacrifice some other topic that that could be interesting. There are a lot of times where I, I might have multiple like good proposals on a single topic, and I just have to pick one. And that's that's the unfortunate reality, which is why the advice that Ben gave earlier is really useful. And uh, advice that Miriam Suzanne originally gave me, which is 
submit at least three proposals for every conference. And you're, you're much less likely to get, get rejected. Someone who does a, a really good job of this is uh, Jennifer Bland. She is uh, amazing. <laughs> she submits oftentimes like 10 proposals that are well put together, which gives you like more opportunities to say yes. You know, and she links to like places where she's written about this and blog posts. And, you know, she links to places where she's, she's spoken. You know, even like sometimes like she'll link to, you know, uh, a video where she's spoken about this, just like recording herself and putting it up on YouTube. And that's, that's really useful. Yeah. And speaking of submissions, I mean, conferences, um, the kind of conference you're submitting to makes a big difference too, right? Whether it's a view conf or to your point, like a multi-track conference that's more generic, like a, jo- like a generic JavaScript conference versus a view conf. Can you speak a little to that? Yeah. I mean, you just kind of think about who's going to be there and like, will the people who will enjoy your talk be at this conference? Or is there a way that you can adapt the talk? You know, so for example, if you have a talk on how to set up excellent linting, you know, with Vue CLI, if you're submitting to a Vue conference, that could be really useful. If you're submitting to a more general conference like Connect Tech or especially uh, All Things Open, something like that, then it might be good to modify that a little bit to maybe something like how to set up a great linting, uh, how to set up great linting on a JavaScript project. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's it's more general. It, it'll appeal to more people and you'll just take out the stuff that is specific to Vue CLI. And sometimes that's possible, sometimes it's not. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, you know, especially with, as you're getting started speaking, you know, when you submit to large conferences like a ViewConf, you know, it's always important to consider like the fact that a portion of the speakers are basically guaranteed to be certain core team members, right? Because when people come to a ViewConf, I would say there's this, like people do, there's like a certain... Or maybe not, maybe I'm getting some I'm getting some facial reactions. I feel like certain conferences bring in like it's expected that you hear from certain like I don't I don't know how I don't want to say this. Does anyone can anyone pick up where prominent like, members of the community? Yes. Yeah. I mean, okay, yes, that's better. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like if you're going to a concert. I mean, you want to hear the new stuff, but you also want to hear the hits, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a really good analogy. Yeah. You know, so like you'd like some fresh material and you'd like a new experience, but like they also got to play like, uh, I don't know, like... Yeah, like the first album was really good. They may be on the fifth album, but there are still (laughs) songs on the first album that I can't get enough of. So yeah. Yeah, like is the Spice Girls still together? Like you still got to, you still got to play like, uh, tell me what I want, what I really, really want. Like you still got to do that, right? I I imagine they've got to. I yeah, I, feel like I went to a Spice Girls like, conference and I did not sing yeah. that song. <laughs> really? Yeah, oh. I'd be super disappointed. Yeah. That's like the one I know all the words to. <laughs> yeah, the only one. Okay, that's fair. Yeah, no. So I and I don't think that that's a bad thing to have at a view conference. Yeah, I, I think it's just one of these to remember though. That means that it it can be like your odds are technically lower in that regard. Just because, again, the organizers have to organize, like to their to to their point, like the prominent members and the greatest hits, because that's what people are expecting to get when they come to a viewcom. So, if you want to get started speaking more on topics that you know that are probably going to be covered by more prominent members, like do that at local local conferences and more generic, not even not generic, but like just those local conferences are a great way to get started to build up your reputation, as opposed to just going straight for like the the grand stage. Yeah, I mean it. It, it's not exactly, I mean, for at least for the conferences that I do, it's, it, you're not exactly less likely, but you, you're competing with a smaller pool. You know, I, I like to have about like half people that are like well known within the community and half people who are less known in the community and, you know, and new speakers. Oftentimes I like to, you know, pull in like a quarter to a third new speakers to make sure, you know, we're getting like f- fresh people in the ecosystem and that the, the view ecosystem is a place where like, People, you know, can actually advance their careers and can get their ideas out there. And speaking of that, what were your impressions as far as speakers getting paid? Because I think this can be a common misconception as well with people. I literally have no idea if speakers get paid. I assume it it varies by conference or reputation level. (laughs) (laughs) It actually just depends on whether you ask for it. Incredible. <laughs> I mean, so like, it's not like, you know, if, if you are completely unknown in the community and you say like, hey, 
you know, I'm not going to speak unless I get $5,000. <laughs> then you're probably like, not going to speak. <laughs> I, yeah, you're like, oh, I, I'm so sorry we won't get to see you this year. <laughs> <laughs> the nicest way ever to reject someone. <laughs> But a lot of people who, who are well-known like do ask for some amount of money. $1,000 is a pretty common number for speakers that are, that are quite well-known and very seasoned. You know, and some people ask for more, some people ask for less. Right. But I think those are the people, though, that typically bring in like audience members, right? They help to sell tickets because when they speak or give a keynote, like these are people that help to increase revenue for organizers. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas I think... Yeah, I think what most people need to know is like standard, I think, speaker package, which is generally agreed upon by the speaker community, is that you'll have your flight and hotel like accommodation. Usually they'll throw you like a speaker dinner or whatnot. Usually all those things are taken care of. But I think speaker fees are not standard across most conferences just because, yeah, I know that most conferences wouldn't be able to, like, it's not sustainable that way. Even flights and accommodation, that's often only if, if you ask for it. You know, oh, so... I've been really lucky. <laughs> there, there has to be like a box somewhere where you check to say like, I need like lodging and flights paid for. And don't be shy about checking that box. You know, unless you're living on the other side of the world from the conference, it's probably not that bad to fly you out there and, uh, you know, keep you for a couple nights and, and people won't mind that. And it's in the budget. So don't feel like you have to pay for that all yourself to get a more of a chance to speak for conferences that are, that are well organized. Like there is a budget for that. Yeah. And more importantly, please don't like if a conference organizer asks you to pay for a ticket, trust me, this has happened. That is not okay. Like you do not need to pay the organizer so that you can speak. Yeah. There are, there are conferences that do that. Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, Wow. Yeah. You you can tell them, uh, I'm so sorry we won't be seeing each other this year. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I would say it's fairly standard to ask for, to Chris's point, like flight and accommodation. I think that's the most standard speaker package that most people get. And don't be shy about writing an email after you get accepted to just like make sure, you know, in case it wasn't clear in the CFP process, you know, whether flight or flight and accommodations be paid for. Because you don't, you don't want to find out at the last minute and then like have to, you know, change your vacation time or whatever you're doing. Yes. It never hurts to ask. A lot of people also wonder, like, how do I ask for it if it's not clear? Like, how do I actually send that email? And do I say like, hey, so like, I just checking in, uh, do I have to pay for this myself or will you pay for it for me? And uh, unfortunately, I think a lot of conference organizers, you know, because they are working with a budget that is fixed. If you ask like, hey, like, should I pay for this myself or, or should I, or is this something that you reimburse for? Then they might say like, oh, you can pay for it yourself <laughs> if you're offering <laughs> That's awful. So yeah. yeah, I would phrase it more like, hey, I just wanted to confirm that for the conference, like lodging and flights would be paid for, uh, lodging and travel. Yeah, I know that some speakers too, you can actually email the conference ahead of time. I, I know that more conferences are trying to actually be upfront about this on the CFP page to let you know that it's covered. But you can always ask like, what is a speaker accommodation package? And that'll immediately, if they're just like, oh, we have none, then you know immediately. Like, <laughs> I mean, that's pretty rare though. I, I, would, I would apply. And then if you actually get accepted, then you can, then sure. you can check. So that's, if you get okay. accepted, you can still say no. So that's, that's not true. like considered a faux pas because that's actually something I've wondered about personally. Like if you get no. accepted and you're like, oh, sorry about that. Bye. <laughs> Absolutely not. If you're doing it at the last minute, that could be an issue. Okay, but yeah. if, if they nice. send you an acceptance notice... And you say, hey, listen, I, I'm sorry. I already just like accepted uh, to speak at uh, yeah. another conference that is happening around the same time. They will totally understand. We get that all the time. Like if you're, if you're good, then you're going to be in demand. And if you're in demand, then you're going to be in short supply. Yep. So is there usually like a, a backup list of speakers <laughs> for like... For the just in case if you drop out, is that is that a thing? Yeah, that's where like we'll go back to the short list. And there are almost always like some people who drop out, like maybe right at the beginning, or you know, eventually like something comes up. Like let's say a, a family member gets sick and you know, or or you get sick. Like th- things happen, life happens. Like we, we understand, you know, we're not gonna see it as totally unprofessional. How dare you get the flu? <laughs> <laughs> About four years into my career, I got tired of going from job to job where I'd either get laid off from a job I liked 
or wind up quitting a job that I couldn't take anymore. And eventually, I wound up going freelance. I made a bunch of friends, and we started a podcast called The Freelancer Show. The Freelancer Show has been running for about seven years now and features not necessarily the same people that we started the show with, but experts in running a business and people who are out there actually doing freelance work. You can check it out at thefreelancershow.com. So are you want to you wanna lead us out on the picks? Sure. So this week, I have two picks, and they're both TV shows. Both are on Netflix, and both are written and directed by Ricky Gervais. The first one is Afterlife, two words, not one. And it's a, he's, he's the star, and his wife has just passed away from breast cancer. And it's about him trying to navigate the world without her and how to navigate his bitterness at the world without her. And in typical Ricky Gervais fashion, it is both hilarious and human. I guess that's the best way to describe it. Um, Both of the shows are very human in their approach to situations you find yourself in life. They will make you laugh and they will make you cry. Just say. And the second show is called Derek. He is a nursing home attendant uh, who is a little on the simpler side. And I swear, if you don't cry at some point watching that show, you have no soul. Just you don't. I love it because that show, even though it centers around, you know, the end of life, it's very much a celebration of life. And so if you're looking for something that will both depress you and uplift you, those are both really good shows to watch. Depress you and uplift you. Sounds yeah, like no, it, it is, but it's so worth it. <laughs> I highly recommend them. Sounds good. Okay. I can go next. I think my pick is something that came out quite some time ago, actually, from, from Hannah Gatsby. I, I recently saw her TED Talk. Uh, and it reminded me of her stand-up, which is like on Netflix. It's called Nanette. Yes, and it's just so good. It's like one of the best one of the best stand-up routines that I've ever seen. Fantastic. Yeah, Go cool. check it out by Hannah Gatsby, Nanette. And let's see what else have I been doing lately? Oh yeah. Oh, there's this game. There's this game that I've been playing a little bit of lately called TIS 100. So it's made by these these people who make really geeky, really really geeky puzzle games, sort of. They also made a game called Wait, Space Camp. What, really okay, what's a really geeky puzzle game? I, what, what does that mean? Okay, so <laughs> in TIS 100, you are basically like solving programming problems in assembly. And like, you know, a version of assembly, you know, with, Wait, with extra is- limitations. <laughs> it's actually harder than re- real assembly in a lot of ways. And solving like often kind of higher level programming problems that you would normally never do in assembly. Are you sure this is a game? Yes, it is a game. <laughs> okay. But it, it's the kind of game. Listen, listen, listen. I don't know if uh, you're listening to this out loud and maybe there are like coworkers or your boss around. I want you to know if you play this game, it will look like you're working. Oh, I like games like that. <laughs> it's, it's great. No one will be able to tell this isn't work and they'll just think like, wow, you know, uh, Sarah really has her head down, you know, working on this. I shouldn't bother her. Oh, it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to use that. So TIS 100, so much fun if you like that kind of thing. And honestly, like programming is so much more fun when you're not getting paid for it. I don't know why that is. Yeah, yeah. Th- there's a oh, and I came up with a really great solution where I converted like, oh, I don't, I don't want to say because it's a spoiler, but like... Oh. <laughs> I came up with a really nice algorithm one time and it was like, uh, it, 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 it was a hard problem. And it told me like, oh, this is actually the fastest like possible solution there is. And it's like, yes, I knew it. Oh, it was for, <laughs> it was for dividing by two. And I found that like, I, I came up with a, a really great solution for it. That was so much faster. Oh, oh it was great. That's awesome. And that's it for my picks. Yeah, uh, I guess for me this week, um, I'm actually recording from France. So my friends, uh, my pick this week will be Paris, France. Got to enjoy my uh, authentic patisserie this this morning and have like authentic French croissants. And it's been a fantastic time here. So if you're looking for good food and good times, Paris is a lot of fun. Magnifique. What, what brings you to France? That's a secret. I'll tell you about later. <laughs> <laughs> it's a secret. Ooh, okay. Yes. Yeah, I don't know when this will be released, but when, yeah, uh, more to come on that for anyone following me. Wow. Yeah. And with some mystery. Hey, there's our final, there's our final like, advice for talks like and with a little mystery you know leave a cliffhanger <laughs> so that we're looking to forward to the next talk or something like that yeah 
I like this. Perhaps revealed in the next episode? To be continued. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe two or three. Ooh, ooh, keep keep listening. It might be the next episode, so you better listen to the next one too. Just like That's keep right. going. Eventually we'll come back to this. <laughs> All right. Ari, right, would you like to take us out? Sure. That's it for this episode of Views on View. Thank you for joining us. Until next week, enjoy the view. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.